Right, let's start. We're core eight and it has gone 10. Um, so welcome everyone to New Shah Hall. Uh, we, as you know, um, we allow filming and photography at public meetings. Please feel free to take pictures and tweet. Uh, can everyone though, please turn their mobile phones to silent or vibrate for the meeting? Um, it's fine for me because I've actually left my phone at home. Um, there's no fire alarm test scheduled today, so if it sounds, it's for real. And the muster point is the uh, fire exit um, and we assemble in the car park. Right. Uh, first item is apologies for absence. Um, Democratic Services Manager, please report any apologies. Yes, um, I have apologies from Councillor Batchelor and Councillor Dupre substituting, and apologies from Councillors Billington and Sanderson. Thank you. And um, Councillor Tierney is not present. Thank you. Um, does any member wish to declare a disclosable pecuniary interest or non statutory disclosable interest? No. Thank you. We'll move to the minutes. We're being asked to approve the minutes of the meeting on the 7th of December as a correct record. Uh, does any member who does not agree with this please uh, raise their hand? I see no hands. So uh, I will sign them as a complete record. Thank you. So first item is the senior manager pay data and pay policy statement. Could I please ask Lindsay to introduce this report? Good morning. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, yes, the senior manager pay data and pay policy statement um, is here to satisfy the requirements of the local government transparency code 2015. Um, alongside your pack of information, um, you will have the salary data to be published, which is in Appendix 1 and 1B. You have the chief officer pay policy statement in Appendix 2. And Appendix 3 is the organisational charts that show the, the, the top three tiers of the organisation from the chief executive downwards. Um, there is presentation on the screen, which just highlights some of the main points that I'm going to run through. So hopefully that will ease, but they do follow the similar format to the report. So hopefully it's clear and easy for you to follow. Um, so the first thing, in accordance with the code, the first thing that we publish is the pay details and the names of those employees that earn over £150,000. And you'll see from the report and the presentation that we have four, Gillian Beasley, Rachel Stopard, Wendy Ogle Wellborn and Steve Cox. Now, the first thing you'll notice with these is that some of them have left the organisation. Um, and the reason why they are showing and being reported um, is the reporting period for the purposes of this report is January to December 2021. Um, so they are on there because we will need to report on them. Um, and the second thing to highlight is the fact that all four of those roles are shared. And in fact, some of them aren't directly employed by us, but we are still reporting them. And the reason being is that the transparency code is, as it says, really, it's all about transparency of pay. I think it would be misleading if we didn't show these. So what we do is we report on them, but we make it clear on the information that we submit um, that they are shared posts. And we also make it clear where we don't employ um, the officers that are listed. Um, the next thing you'll see is the salary details and organisational chart for the top three tiers. That's something that we, we are required to publish, um, in addition to the employees earning £50,000 and above. Now, having a little look at the highlights of the numbers within these, we've got 37 posts in tier one to three, which is fairly comparable with last year's 35. And in terms of those earning £50,000 more, we have 177, which compares with 156 last year. So that's quite a significant increase. And there's a couple of things I'd just like to highlight, if I may, around that. Um, first of all, the £50,000 is the total remuneration. So it's not just the base salary of those individuals. So there are a number of people that are showing on those spreadsheets and that data that you have that earn less than £50,000. But because they've perhaps got multiple posts with us, um, they have um, done some overtime or received some enhanced rate of pay for working maybe weekends or evenings, it's taken them above that £50,000 threshold. So they are reported on there. And again, that should be made clear on the information that's, that's available to you. Um, 
the other the other and I think the point to say with that is in terms of the multiple contracts and the overtime we do know that because there was some increased demand on some services that use um, staff that are perhaps on relief contracts who have secondary posts with us we know over the course of the pandemic that that has increased so there are more on there than um, we've seen perhaps in the past but the other thing to be aware of is that £50,000 threshold has not changed and does not change year on year yet our salaries although we've got to pay award pending our salaries do tend to increase so every year we do expect there to be more people above that 50,000 whether or not they they review that 50,000 I don't know but at the moment that explains some of the increase the next thing we've got there is some calculations we've got the median salary the mean salary and the pay multiple um, the median salary is just over 27,000 the mean just less than 37,000 and they're comparable with last year's which is unsurprising as we haven't had a pay award pending this year and pay award paid this year yet um, and then our pay multiple demonstrates the ratio between the highest of our earners and the lowest and what I will say with this is we do use the chief executive's full salary so although during this period we only paid a proportion of her salary it would be misleading if we showed only a proportion of that it would take our pay ratio to, to an odd number and it wouldn't look right so for transparency purposes um, we report on the full salary which does mean that we don't expect to see a significant change when we report next year when we have our own dedicated chief executive that we're paying full salary for um, and just in terms of that one to six to kind of contextualize it there used to be a target years and years ago um, as part of local government um, requirements there used to be a target of one to 20 as a ratio that was removed when Hutton did a pay review back in 2011 but it's something that a lot of councils still kind of have in the back of their mind and you know we don't report how we are comparing against it but I think it's good to know that the one to six is well below um, what used to be the target there um, and then the final thing is the chief officer's pay policy statement, which you'll see this doesn't change um, drastically year on year, but it comes to you. Um, and then we ask you to recommend it to full council to be approved um, as something that we look at every year and just refresh and make sure that it's up to date. So I think they were the main points I wanted to highlight within that group of paper, but I appreciate there's a lot of information there. So if you've got any questions, by all means, ask. Thank you very much. Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Um, a few points from me, and I'm sorry if some of this is obvious to everybody else. I'm only a substitute here today, and this is not my comfort zone. Um, first thing on this, um, I thought it was, uh, it's not a question really, but just moderately amusing that we're very careful to name employees paid 150,000 and above, but only give post titles for those below when you could very easily match it with the organization chart and fill in a lot of those gaps, but that's kind of by the by. Um, the, the second and three points. The, the, the middle one is actually a question. The pay policy statements uh, on Appendix 2 starts by saying that we're committed to operating consistent, transparent and equitable pay arrangements. And I wondered if those three words, consistent, transparent and equitable, were actually defined anywhere. Um, I haven't seen a definition of that and I wondered how we, how we defined that. Um, and I was going to ask about targets and strategies, but um, that's already been helpfully covered in the, the um, introduction to this, um, which I want to come on to in terms of the pay multiple uh, on page 13. Um, the council monitors the ratio between the remuneration of its chief officers and deputies and the rest of the workforce. And going back to definitions again, the definition of the word monitor is to observe and check the progress or quality of something over a period of time or to keep under systematic review. And my question really was review to what end? Um, if you are a nurse monitoring someone's blood pressure or blood sugar, you know that there is a point that it climbs above or dips below at which where you need to take some sort of action. If you're the environment agency monitoring the level of a river, you know that there's a point at which you need to shut the road. Um, monitoring implies that you're looking for something, some kind of trigger or threshold at which you take remedial action. And I can see in the other reports, the pay gaps by gender and by ethnicity or ethnic background, where we're aiming for. I can see that. And I can see a whole host of potential remedial actions. But what I, I can't see that at all for 
the the pay multiple and you've explained that there's no longer a target as it were so therefore my question is what does the word monitor mean what are we looking for what's good what's bad how do we know that we're in the right zone how do we know whether we need to do better whether we are doing better and i'm really struggling with all of that in this part of the report because the word monitoring seems to me to be very difficult when you've got no targets and no strategies and don't know what you're actually looking for or what you would do if you found it thank you would you like to uh, answer that Happy to. Um, in terms of the, the consistent and transparent and the equitable definitions, no, I don't think we have in our policy, to be honest. They are terms that we kind of use quite widely in employment um, policies and employment speak, but I don't think we've defined them. So I think that's a very good point. And that's something we could look to do um, in this policy and make it clearer. We're happy to take that forward. Um, and then the second part in terms of the monitoring the pay ratio, again, that's a very good point. I think it would be fair to say that if the ratio changed year on year and we reported a change next year from this year, we would look at what the causes of that change were and what we needed to do about it. But I think what would probably help committee going forward is if um, we put a comparison with other councils in there. So you could see, would that be useful to see how we sit in terms of others? Because it's information that all councils report. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be worldly different because our top level salaries and our bottom level salaries will be comparable with other councils, but I can certainly put that in in the future if that would help. Thank you. I think that would be helpful. And I, I think that the, um, I think one of the reasons for looking at all this information is to provide some sort of sense check of the impact of policies that are being implemented elsewhere. So pay increase, job definition, you know, reorganization. And, and this is a, a, an opportunity to um, periodically look at the overall impact on things like um, pay equity and so on. So I think it's, it, it, it's monitoring um, the overall impact of, of HR and employment policies within the council. I think that is one of the points of it. And, and to ask questions that come up that are only discernible when you look at the, at the whole. I think that that's that I would I would sort of add that in if that if that's correct. Can I just come back and say I did, I, I agree that's measuring and that measuring is useful, but I'm not sure it's monitoring. That 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 may be very um that that's a very astute um, observation and it, it's it's more um it, it's about the impact, isn't it, or the um, measuring changes or trends or something like that. It's but monitoring. I agree, Councillor Shayla. Yeah, perhaps observing would be a better word. <laughs> keep under observation, I don't know. But um, I always have trouble with the comparators. You know, what do we compare with? And what happens if all councils are trying to be the medium amongst other councils? And, you know, really, what are we trying to achieve? This, this is my scientific background coming in. So you, you need to have something to compare with. And in, in most cases, in, in this sort of thing, I don't think we have anything, really. It, it may be that um, that we could have some key metrics and see what the changes are over a five year period, for example, looking back over the last five years to see how key metrics have changed. And the um, pay ratio, I think, is actually a, is actually a really important one. And even though we haven't not required to report it or whatever I, I still think it, it between the top and the bottom I think is really important other other comments or questions that was a no not a I want to say something <laughs> thank you do you have any other comments or questions no um Thank you. So um, we are asked to um, approve, recommend this statement to council for approval. 
Yes. Thank you. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. That's proved. So pay gap reporting. Thank you. Um, yes, our gender pay gap requirements are needed under the Equality Act 2010. Um, and in addition to the cover report in your pack of information, you have Appendix 1, which is a statutory publication um, that we put on our website, which outlines all the information that we need to report on. But in addition to what we need to report on, it includes our ethnicity pay gap and the action plan, uh, looking at the actions that we will be taking over the course of the next 12 months. Um, the headline figures, as you can see from the slide um, and in your information, um, our gender pay mean gap is 9.6%, which is an increase from last year's of uh, 7.3%. And then our median is 8.6%, which is a decrease on the last year's reported figure of 8.9%. And what this means is that for every male that we pay one pound, we pay female 91 pence. So that gives you the idea as to to how that compares and this is set against a backdrop of a national increase in gender pay gap that's being reported this year um, you'll see on there that our last year's um, 2020 figure was 14.9 percent um, and this year we're reporting or nationally it's being reported at 15.4 percent um, and then in addition to the gender pay gap um, you'll see on the right hand side of the slide the ethnicity pay um, and this follows a council motion back in July 2020 that some of you will remember um, where it was agreed that we would report our ethnicity pay gap. Um, the get pay gap both the mean and the median have not changed from last year we have 2.5 percent for the mean and a minus 2.9 percent for the median which means that when we line up in terms of the median when we line up all of our employees um, and have those that are in a um, ethnic minority they declare as white and those which are not white those in the middle those that are not white are paid 2.9 percent more than those in the middle of the white grouping um, because the ethnicity pay is not a statutory requirement at the moment we follow the same methodology to calculate it that we do with the gender pay gap which is very crudely like we do with the gender pay gap male against female with the ethnicity we look at white against non-white we are doing a piece of work at the moment to improve the data that we hold on ethnicity we're looking um, at around 25 percent of the organization that we don't know their ethnicity for at the moment once we have more fuller data what i hope to be able to bring to you in the future is a breakdown by ethnicity a lot more rather than just those crude groupings um Appendix one, if we may move to the next slide, please. I'm done. Appendix one um, has this um, chart in it. This is something that statutory we need to report on. This shows the pay quartiles. So we've split the organisation into four according to the pay. And what you can see here against the backdrop of 79% of our workforce being female, you can see the differences in the gender split by the quartiles here. And what it's important to note, I think, is although only slight differences in percentages with gender pay gap and because our gap isn't um, particularly large it's still a gap and it's still important we reduce it because it's not particularly large some of these small things do make a significant impact on that gap so we need to look at these even when the percentages aren't that different so I think the point to note here is you can see in the lower quartiles we've got 83 percent and 82 percent females whereas in the upper quartiles we're looking at 75 and 71 percent respectively so they do differ you know there's there is a higher proportion of females in those lower quartiles than there is in the upper quartiles um, and then the next slide shows you um, a little bit more of this. What we've done here um, is broken down by employee type. So we've split our employees into three different groupings. And for the purposes of this report, we've deemed anyone an employee if they're earning £32,000 and less. Professional and management is thirty-two to 75000 with our senior managers and directors on £75,000 and above. And what this shows you, um, that for the employee and the professional and management categories, we're looking at around three quarters female which is not too dissimilar to our workforce profile but for the director and the senior manager you can see there that we're looking at 60 percent female so it's much less um, so the the key here and you'll see some actions um, around this and that's in terms of looking at um, trying to progress women through those senior manager positions the appendix two that you have has quite a lot of statistics and a lot of data in there um, it's important, I think, not just to bring this to you to see where we are with the pay gap, but it really helps us to explain what this means for us as a council, what having a pay gap means, 
what the reasons are for the gap and the increase that we've seen this year. Um, and importantly, it gives us an idea and an indication of what we can do to try and address that gap. Um, and I think the first thing to say with that is the information, the gender pay gap reporting reports on data as of a snapshot. It's a period of time on the 31st of March, the year prior to the publication. So we're publishing this information in March of this year. The data relates to our workforce on the 31st of March last year. So any of the efforts and any of the actions that we've progressed through the course of the last year won't be reflected in the data that we publish, um, unfortunately. Um, and the other thing to note, I think is really important as we go through the analysis and, and the, the percentages I've talked through do explain that slightly, um, is that there isn't a quick win, unfortunately, to this. You know, we've done a lot of analysis in the past and brought to committee um, various different reports in, in detail about the pay gap. Um, and we do have a, an equitable and fair pay structure. We're very structured in terms of our pay lines. We have hay that we use to evaluate all of our jobs. We don't operate bonus schemes and people very rarely move within their grade outside of the incremental progression scheme. So there isn't one particular thing that we can do quite easily and quickly to reduce that gap. What we need to do is have a commitment to a long term sustained planned course of action, looking at this data at, you know, every year, every six months, and looking at what we can do to reduce those pay gaps. So as I take you through the, the next couple of slides, you'll see some of the things I'm talking about may only be kind of a few percentages different in terms of the male and females, but it's important that we note them and look at them and have a commitment to reduce them. Um, so the next slide, please, shows you um, the hourly rate um, by age. And it's it's interesting because the national data um, demonstrated last year that there was a difference in the gender pay gap nationally for those under 40 and those over 40. So we've looked at this in terms of our workforce profile, and you can see that it does match a gap of 5.7% for those that are under 40. But this doubles to 12% when you look at those over the age of 41, 40 and 41. Um, so there is further work to be done to look at who's in that grouping of, of, of employees, what professions and what roles they're in, what career pathways they have, and then what we can do to target them. The other thing that I wanted to mention that has had an impact on our, our gender pay gap um, this year um, and potentially has increased it is the zero hour contracts that we use. So those staff that we term relief um, contracts. Um, and there's two contributors here. There is um, the fact that during the course of the, the first couple of lockdowns we had, um, we had a number of services that used a lot of relief staff, the libraries and children's centres are examples of those, um, where we paid an average pay to those individuals because they were, were not able to go into work, their services were actually closed. They zero hour contracts, we didn't have an obligation to pay them, but we did, we chose to pay them an average pay during that time. So we were paying more people in addition um, to what we would normally be in terms of relief. And then you team that with the fact that in other services that use relief staff, you take our frontline support workers, for example, they had much more increased demand for their services during the course of the pandemic. And therefore, we were using more relief staff. Now, I'm not saying that we pay our relief staff any different, but they predominantly are frontline workers that tend to be in the lower graded um, of our roles. And that relief staff um, contracts, 90% of them are female. So that has and will have an impact on our pay gap um, in terms of the increase that we've seen. So the next slide shows you the starting salaries. Um, and again, this is a small but significant difference. I think it's, it's fair to point out. Um, in the reporting period, the 12 months up to the 31st of March last year, we had 381 employees that moved roles internally or joined us externally into new roles with us and had the opportunity to negotiate their salary. Of these that started, 48% of males started at the bottom of the grade versus 54% of females. And then in terms of the top of the grade, we had 19% of males start at the top, whereas 15% of females. So this would suggest um, that males are better at negotiating salary on starting. They would have had the same information at the recruitment stage. Um, and I think you'll see in the action plan, hopefully, the way we're trying to address this is by having some actions around transparency of pay and making sure it's really clear on both our intranet and our external internet website recruitment pages what those salary scales are. So when somebody's going in for a job with us and starting to talk about salary, they know where the bottom and the top of the grade is. 
The next slide um, is the last one, which shows you some data um, and summarizes again, some of the points that you've got in the report you've seen. Um, and this is to do with our appraisal ratings. Um, now you'll see here, um, performance ratings that lead to incremental progression, not uh, in, in our, um, we've just changed our appraisal process actually this year, but the data relies on those from last year. Last year, an employee needed to be rated a five or a six to be eligible for incremental progression. See progression within the council is not automatic. Um, of those that were rated and received incremental progression, 28% were males and just under 24% were females. When you look at this in terms of contract type, 32% were full-time and 21% were part-time. When we think that predominantly a large part of our part-time workforce is female, that's something that's definitely noteworthy. Um, and then if we look at it in terms of ethnicity and take the same kind of crude groupings that we do with the, the gender pay um, in terms of 28% white and then 21% other than white ethnicity were, were um, put forward. So there are um, some actions you'll see in the action plan around um, reviewing where we are with this. But what I will say is we have a new appraisal process that came into play from April of this year. So these figures won't represent and reflect that new appraisal process. But what we've done with that appraisal process is brought in consideration to behaviours and values, as well as consideration of outcomes. So employees don't need solely just focus on outcomes in their appraisal. What we hope this will do is open up the ability for all of our workforce to be recommended or more likely to be recommended for incremental progression because those in fixed roles, take our library assistants, for example, or our school crossing patrol staff, they have fairly fixed roles. It's quite difficult for them to demonstrate above and beyond which the previous appraisal process required. With the addition of the values and behaviours now, they're able to demonstrate how they do their role and how they create that performance impact through what they do rather than ticking off what what they've done. So we are hoping um, this year we see much more pleasing figures in terms of gender pay and we will obviously review that. We're doing a whole scale review in April of that process. We'll be able to update you later in the year on that. Um, so the last slide just shows you the actions we've taken to date. As I've said, some of these, a lot of these won't be reflected in the figures because there have been things we've been focused on for the last 12 months. Mentioned the appraisal scheme. There's been huge amounts of engagement um, over the course of the last year. Um, I'm not going to go into these in huge amounts of detail because Janet's got a report later on on people strategy and a lot of this is covered. I just wanted to pick out the highlights. Um, the flexibility is a big one. That's something that gender pay gap service do recommend you really push to try and reduce your pay gap. We've done a lot around that in terms of asking, um, giving people the option to ask to work from home, to be a remote worker. We have team charters in place for all of our services to outline what the expectations are for office working for how they work. We've introduced flexible bank holidays for staff in the last couple of months. Um, and we're also a flexible from first employer, which means that people can um, request flexible working from day one of employment. They don't have to wait till the six month statutory requirement. And then obviously we've got the real living wage, um, which we are hoping will have an impact on our gender pay gap next year. But that was approved and processed in April and backdated last year. So obviously again, won't be reflective in the figures. And then in terms of things to do, we've listed there, but you'll have the full action plan um, in the publication, which hopefully you've had a chance to review. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, full introduction and even more full uh, report. Lots of food for thought there. Councillor Netzinger. Thank you. Um, Lindsay, I just wondered if you could put the slides up again and go back to the slide which had um, there was one that had um, the proportion of our um, workforce who are male and female in the different categories. So there was employee, professional and management. And would you be able to put that one up again? If you can't. Oh, OK. Sorry. Dad's doing it. <laughs> I'm very sorry. If it's really difficult, don't worry at all. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that um, in an ideal world, you might hope that you have a relatively even balance of gender split across lots and lots of roles because I don't think there's any evidence that men and women have hugely different skills and talents in all sorts of things and we work really hard to be trying to persuade um, women to do more STEM subjects and do more of what I mean it just seems to me that actually we should be trying harder to persuade more men to come and do some of our other roles and I don't think you've mentioned that um, and uh, I think it might have been the one before or after that Dan I'm very sorry after in that case that one <laughs> um so 
So actually, if you look at that slide, our senior manager and director proportions look much better than our employee ones. And, and if you're really thinking about how to tackle gender imbalance in this organisation, I think that the thing you need to concentrate really hard on is getting a better balance um, coming in at the bottom. Um, and I don't think we've talked about that at all. Um, so that's my point. Councillor Dupre. Uh, thank you. I mean, really data rich report and data rich presentation and slides. So thank you so much for that. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm disappointed I'm only a substitute on this now. Um, <laughs> just, 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 just one question on the ethnicity pay gap. Um, 3.1 talks about organizations using <coughs> different classifications. And I wondered which classification we used and why we had chosen it over other potential classifications and what the impact of that might be. And I speak as someone who will give you a different answer depending on how the question is phrased. If you ask me about my ethnicity, I will tell you I'm white British. If you ask me about my ethnic background, I will tell you I'm white other. So, you know, it, 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 and I can't be the only one. So it, it kind of matters. And I, I didn't have a, a clue about that in this report. And I, I know you can't put everything on the pizza here, but you know, just some sense of what processes you went through to choose that and what you expected to get out of that compared to another classification would be really interesting. Would you like to answer this? Oh, yes, happy to. Um, so in terms of picking up on Councillor Netzinger's point about the bringing men into all categories, I think that's an excellent point and something we can add into the action plan um, for this year for when it goes into publication. So um, I will add those in. Um, <laughs> excuse me. In terms of classification, um, this has been a difficult one, to be honest with you, to, um, to work out what's best, how best to represent this. Our classifications and the categories that we use for ethnicity on our ERP, on our HR systems, um, are comparable with other local authorities. They're fairly set. And, and the reason we've had those is that allows us to then do some comparators, some benchmarking with other councils. However, the categories that we use for the ethnicity pay gap is very crudely just white, the non those that have declared that they are non-white. And that's to get the, the actual pay gap to show, like you do with males and females, literally the differences between the white and the non-white ethnicities. Um, I'm not saying it's ideal. Um, and I think when, um, when, I'm sure it's when, not if, ethnicity pay gap reporting becomes a statutory requirement, will be given those, the legislation will outline what those categories are. But what I can commit to doing is, as I've said, we are looking to increase the data that we hold on ethnicity. And what we can do, hopefully going forward, is provide you with these pay gaps according to the categories that we do have. So it doesn't just group everybody into that non-white category. Hopefully that'll help. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Councillor Shaler, then Councillor Dew. The, um, those little charts on the, the gender difference, the same one that Lucy wanted to look at. If you could bring that up, is it possible? Yeah. I mean, it's... But it, the, the kind of point I wanted to make was that, that this pay gap, it uh, represents job gap. It, it depends, so who gets the jobs that pay more in a way. And given that we are, the one, the one with the actual charts, uh, the, the little, that one, that one, that one. So here, we have to think that we're not functioning in a vacuum. We are competing against a, against a sexist society. And so it, you would imagine that if we have the same number of males and females, our female staff would be of higher quality, just, just because of the, the way that society works. Now, that what this, this chart suggests to me is that we're paying our senior management too much because we are much more competitive in that market, or we're paying the bottom grades too little because we're not attracting as many men who in the general market have more options so it's what we do here is important but we have to think of it in the, the wider context as well that that point the other thing was 
the the very lowest grades um, part time. I've spoken to some people that are in early care, early help for children, and the appraisals they think is a complete waste of time because there's no chance of of getting any more money. There was there was no pay rise, and you know what was the point? So that that's at the other end of the scale, and so that might be reflecting some of the numbers we're seeing there. Any any response? I think um, it's an interesting point that you make. One uh, around the um, the largest group of staff, which is the employees at the sort of the, on the left hand um, pie chart. There, I think one of the things that we have to factor into our thinking is the nature of those roles, um, and a high number of those roles are in social care. Um, Lindsay's talked about library service in roles that typically tend to attract more women than men, and pay might very well be a factor in that but I think it's sort of it links back to the point Councillor Nessinger made about how do we do more to attract people and men into those roles um, and we I think can talk to colleagues within our team about how we do more around our apprenticeships uh, T levels all of the things the kickstart scheme we need to do more to encourage more men to address that balance um, and and to delve into a bit in a bit more detail you know what might be the factors that prevent typically prevent men from going into those roles in large numbers thank you very much um councillor do you thank you chair yeah thank you for the report it made, made a fool like me understand a quite a complex and interesting subject i'm always a, uh, a bit concerned when we, when we look at basically binary presentations i mean you know it's uh, what, what one or the other and uh, I think there's a lot more depth to it and I understand some of it's statutory so you've got to do it and some of it you know we're, we're feeling our way on so uh, you know and, and um, the gender pay gap I mean the, the part that uh, where um, the uh, no it's the uh, um, the uh, racial pay gap rather or the ethnicity pay gap let's get the right look um, the sort of two percent swinging either way I didn't think was a huge um imbalance what might be though is if we've got people when you break those groups down further we find there's a certain group that are actually miles targets off so i'd like to see you know that um waved out and as you say the government uh, may well do something to force a hand on that um but i do think on uh, some of the ones we're actually slightly stymied by the type of organization we are it's, it's very well to talk about getting more men in to do um, the jobs we need doing at the lower scales but if you look at the workforce as a whole out there whether we like it or not men tend to go into what I would call you know, my father grew up doing the laboring type of jobs and women go into the more caring ones and it's how you get it, the society as a whole to deal with that I think because although you're going to build in society now the one I went on this week there was 10 people working there and two were ladies which is great uh, you know it's, it's good to see but it's still not balanced now and from the men I doubt if you'd get many of the guys there going into caring occupations but I have two or three friends as indeed kevin has got a cousin who's very involved in the caring side of things so how we do that so and i think we're slightly skewed here what the point i'm getting to and you'll be pleased to hear there is one is of course we're now skewed because as a council we outsourced a lot of our laboring type of jobs when highways went a few years ago so if we were a council who still had our highways internally we may see that balance come forward now how the heck we get that to reflect on this so we can actually say there appears to be a skew here but i don't know but i would think you know i can't remember how many were in highways but there was quite a lot that went out uh, and that would you know it's predominantly a male laboring force so uh, it would make a difference. So how, how you do that and it just, just help us more because otherwise it looks like, I, I don't think it looks exactly how it is, if you follow what I mean, but I know across society as a whole, you know, let's be honest, I'm going to sound slightly wrong here, but completely right. I've always felt the best person should get the job, whether that's male or female. And I've changed that over the years because I used to say the best man should get the job. And if that happens to be a female, brilliant. And I actually really have moved on from that. And I think, you know, the best people should get the job. Some of these things we've got to tackle. And, uh, you know, I think the thing that we've got to show is we've got a fair system. I think that's what people get upset about. If, as has been mentioned by Councillor Shaler, if you have an appraisal and think, what's the point? It doesn't strike you that you're in a fair system. So whatever happens, we need to reflect that as well. But, but generally, I think it's heading the right way. And I look forward to the day when you say we don't need to do these reports anymore, because actually, whether you're male, female, black, white, green, Martian, we're all trapped the same and the best person's getting the best job at the best right can also say as one final point on the interview panels i've been on here 
we do have, which have all been at the higher level, we do tend to have people coming in and say they're in that grade package, they're almost delivered to us within it. I don't remember us sitting down and saying, no, we can, we, we decided where we wanted to go necessarily before. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we did have that with the chief executive that we both got told these are the bands they're in, they're in different bands. But, you know, when, and um, we made the decision on who we felt was the right person, not the pay grade, but it could have skewed it hugely one way or the other. Um, if, if we do that across. So I'll leave it there anyway, but uh, for, food for thought and thank you for the information. Thank you. There's uh, quite a few really um, uh, meaty points there. Granular data around ethnicity, procurement policies. Um, are there any sort of comments you'd like to make? Yes, I would just like to add, if I may, I think Councillor G, you raise a really interesting point there around the, the makeup of the workforce. Um, and you'll see, I haven't got it on the slides, but you'll see in the appendix two with the data that you've got, I've put a comparison against other councils. I had a look at other county councils. This is for the gender pay gap, because not many are reporting on ethnicity pay gap yet. But in terms of gender pay gap, and, and the one that kind of struck a chord really, and I wanted to know more about was Hertfordshire that reported last year a three point. 3.5% pay gap, which is small. They're a comparable council to us. Um, I phoned them up. I spoke to somebody in the HR team there um, and started the conversation by hearing that this year they will be reporting a 0.3, I think it was, or 0.4 pay gap. So they've reduced it even further. We had a really detailed conversation around why, you know, we talked about our workforce profile in terms of male, female, the quartiles, what actions they're taking didn't get anything from there and then one thing at the end of the conversation came to me I asked them about the the makeup of their their workforce they have fire service in there so their pay gap for the fire service especially when you look at the retained roles that the fire service have which are not necessarily paid particularly highly they're predominantly male and they feel that that has reduced their gender pay gap so we are battling with a workforce that doesn't help us with our figures but that's not to say we, we shouldn't do anything about it it. So hopefully the commitment and the actions here will keep us pushing forward and keep us seeing a reduction in that gap. Thank you. No, that's that's really interesting. Um, uh, unless there's any further questions, I, I, I have a, a, a question as well, um, which is, um, uh, I mean, I've worked in an organisation which decided it was going to end the pay gap and took quite radical steps to do that and effectively did it. Um, it is possible even in a sexist society, even in a kind of sexist industry uh, or sector um, to, to take steps that, that counter what's going on outside in society. It is really important to get more men into our, our low paid roles, but when the sexist society encounters our own policies is I think, where we really need to take action. So the things that really struck a chord were when there was negotiation, when uh, the, the performance rating, particularly against part-timers, predominantly women, um, they do suggest some sort of unconscious bias or systematic bias in our processes, whether we um, you know, and, and they won't be deliberate, but the, but they, that the evidence is there that um, that that's the case, and so um, uh, obviously not a matter for this report. But I I wonder if it might be possible to think about what are the things that really could make a step change in this, um, if if that's acceptable. Shayla. Yeah, just a brief comment. You know, the the traditional roles that women take were traditionally more women dominated ones. I mean, it, it always seems to me just pay more, you know, that they seem to get paid less for those traditionally women's roles. So pay them more. And then then that would maybe get more men in there because they have more choice. The, the other um, comment I'd like to make that we are an unusual employer in, in some ways but because we employ so many women we, we can actually lead in, in many of these things and, and so this, this is why this kind of data is really important I think 
Thank you. Are there any other comments or suggestions? So we are asked to, uh, we've considered the report and asked to recommend the uh, pay gap report 2021 appendix one to council. Is everyone happy to do that? Yes, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for all the work on, on that. Um, and we look forward to future reports. Right. Uh, the County Council People Strategy, Janet. Thank you. Uh, so the purpose of this report is to give you an update on some of the progress and achievements we've made against the People Strategy over the last 12 months and to give you um, some clarity around the next stages uh, of how we intend to proceed with reviewing uh, the People Strategy this year. So uh, the report sets out that the current version of the People Strategy was approved in, by full council in May 2019. It was a two year strategy from 2019 to 21. And, um, had all things been equal, we would have um, been looking to get a new strategy approved before the end of 21. But with COVID uh, throwing us a curveball, um, that's sort of taken us a little bit longer. But the um, intention is that we'll be working on the next version of the people strategy, what we're working on at the moment, with a view to, um, to bringing that to full council um, this year. And obviously now we have our new chief executive who will be uh, heavily engaged in working with us on that. Um, so we know that uh, over the last two years we've had COVID, uh, the pandemic itself has had a real impact on our workforce and has led us to really thinking about the way that we work. Um, it's provided us some real uh, challenges, but there have been benefits in some ways um, to the way we've operated and we've learned many lessons from doing that that we're intending to, um, to capitalise on and make sure we retain across the workforce. Um, the People's Strategy Action Plan has been revisited and uh, we've, we've, that's very much a, a working document that we've updated several times and we've um, set that out in Appendix 1 for you to have a look at. Um, and as we come to an end, come to an end to that, as I said, that we're, we're um, very much looking at the next stage of the strategy, uh, the next strategy, which will be uh, launched later this year. And Staffing Appeals Committee will be very much involved in that. It'll come to yourselves for approval before um, we go to full council with that. There's information um, in Appendix 2 of the document setting out the workforce profile, and some of that we've already touched on um, in, the, in Lindsay's previous reports. But our workforce strategy um, has five themes. Um, those are set out in 2.7, resourcing, employee engagement, well-being, skills development and behaviours, and then reward and recognition. So what we've tried to do in this report is give you a, an, an update on um, what we, activity there has been under those key areas. I won't take you through all of it because there's an awful lot of information in here, as I'm sure you've seen, but um, in, with intent, focusing on resourcing first, um, some of the key things I wanted to pull out really, um, recruitment is a huge challenge. I'm sure you'll have heard this um, through various different offices across the council. Recruitment and retention um, is becoming more and more challenging for us. Um, it's been a challenge for a number of years, but COVID has made that even more challenging. So it is an area we are really focusing on. Um, we are in the process of reviewing um, and replacing our e-recruitment system, which um, managers who use it are delighted about because it is very antiquated and doesn't, is not, doesn't have a great deal of functionality. Um, so that's going to be renewed and replaced, rolled out uh, in July this year. And that gives us an opportunity to completely review the way we recruit into the organisation um, and be much more agile and modern in the techniques that we use. Um, so we have a programme of work that is underway at the moment to um, look at the system, the tools and techniques we use, taking into consideration some of the things we've already talked about, about trying to uh, change the, trying to attract um, a more diverse range of uh, employees and to have a much more inclusive approach to our recruitment. Um, that will all be supported and rolled out with a new uh, range of training for managers um, over the, during the spring months of 2022. Um, we are also, we've looked at better ways of advertising, um, much more use of social media, um, reaching out to a different range of audiences because we know that 
especially uh, the different demographics. We have to look at how, you know, the way people want to be able to apply for a job these days. They don't want to fill out an old fashioned application form. They want to be able to do it on their phone um, and in much more simple terms. So all of that is under review at the moment. 3.8 specific references retention and social care because we know that's um, a major issue for us uh, in some teams we've had 24 percent turnover um, that's not necessarily unusual for the sector but nonetheless we have to do everything we can um, to to recruit and retain the best people uh, for Cambridge uh, in a very, very competitive marketplace. Um, so we have implemented, as you will all be aware, because this has gone through committee um, in recent months, um, some retention payments for some of our social workers to try and um, re recruit and retain people uh, better in those areas. So in some cases, we have social workers who are um, able to receive an additional 20% of their starting salary um, to, to try and attract them into the organisation. We've also um, had the, our, the Kickstart scheme up and running this year. Um, the government announced the launch of that national scheme in 20, September 2020, um, and that you'll probably be aware is to create new job placements for 16 to 24 year olds who are on universal credit and at risk of long term unemployment. And we've had 10 people come through that scheme, Lindsay, that's right. And um, one of those, uh, peop one of those uh, people has just recently uh, been uh, recruited into a permanent role, which is fantastic. We obviously hope to see uh, see more of that happening. We've also introduced T-level placements, and that came from uh, one of our elected members who made contact and asked us to follow up on that last year. Um, so we've gone into a partnership with Cambridge Regional College to offer T-level placements to students um, as well. So we want to do far more of this to try and get more young people um, into the organisation. And that's the way forward. And then moving on to um, section four, that's around employee engagement. Um, we've done a lot um, on this in the last two years, really, but um, kept up the focus in the last 12 months around engagement surveys, which we started doing more regular engagement surveys in June 2020. Um, and those have been really helpful in getting um, much greater insight uh, into what our workforce is experiencing across uh, the organisation both throughout the pandemic and in broader issues. Um, so we've now set the topics for the next 12 months and we will be launching uh, a survey on equality, diversity and inclusion in February, actually March now, early March, I should say. Uh, then in May, we'll be doing something around wellbeing and health and safety because hopefully a lot of people will have started coming back into the workplace by then. In September, we're focusing on communications. November will be about our working patterns um, and the way we work and then in January next year we'll be revisiting our respect at work um, engagement survey so that we will hopefully be able to track some progress against that and I'm sure you'll all be aware also the Cambridge conversations have continued um, that's set out in 4.4 and Stephen Moyer has agreed to continue with those because they've been so incredibly well received actually they're a 30 minute session every fortnight and uh, we generally have uh, up to almost up to the maximum of 350 people on those calls when we each fortnight that those take those happen and then they can be viewed afterwards because um, they're stored on camweb so that's really helped us up the our, up the ante around employee engagement um, and that's one of the one of the positive byproducts of this enforced working from home because we've had to find new, different, much more effective ways of communicating with people. Um, section five sets out our activity around wellbeing. And again, that's been a huge area of focus for us because we just simply can't underestimate the impact that the last two years has had on people's wellbeing. Um, and so we launched a, a, a wellbeing group at that time, which still runs and meets fortnightly and that brings together people colleagues from public health from HR from health and safety um, to make sure that we've got and, and from learning and development to make sure we've got a real focus on well-being and if you haven't seen our well-being portal which is on CAMWeb I would urge you to have a look at it it's very easy to find from the front screen of 
um, from CAMWeb and it hosts a huge amount of information for people which has been really well received and we've had some very positive feedback um, from existing staff and also importantly I think from new starters who've told us recently that um, they felt it was a really good message that the organisation values its staff because so many, uh, so much effort goes into wellbeing. So there is an awful lot of information there. We do a monthly wellbeing hour on a wide range of subjects. In fact, the next one is in about an hour's time, I think, and it's about work at home working and making sure people are looking after themselves when they're home working. Um, also, we've spent a lot of time looking at respect at work in the last year, and some of you may have um have seen some of the information that's come out of that so we did a, an engagement survey um with staff and that gave us some challenging feedback i would say which we've been discussing with clt the corporate leadership team um we did a, we ran a series of focus groups on the back of that engagement survey to try and get a greater understanding of what people were telling us some of the information that came out is linked to the earlier reports people were saying that there were it felt it was more difficult some people felt it was more difficult to progress within the organization um or um to be promoted or to get access to learning the right learning and development if they were from different characteristics so there's we're doing a lot more work around that and we have actually updated our policy um, we've um, updated the policy and rolled out um, a program of respect at work contacts across the organization of people who will be um, members of staff will be able to contact speak confidentially about any concerns that they have um, which we hope will make a, a positive impact on that but something we're keeping a very close eye on and we'll be revisiting um, this year the employee assistance program just uh, just to reassure you we do have very comprehensive employee assistant program and we have had for a number of years now but we have promoted that more and more during the last two years and actually we've seen the, uh, the usage of the scheme go up by almost 15 percent in the last year hopefully because we have been promoting it so much and encouraging people to access it and also reminding people that as well as being available for our own staff it's also available for um, people's part, uh, dependents uh, so um, any dependent children living at home and partners are also able to access that which I think is um, something that is worth worth noting is sets that scheme a part of it and then moving on to skills and development and skills development and behaviors we've talked already Lindsay's mentioned that we have changed what was our perform PADP scheme performance appraisal development scheme into something that's now called our conversations it's a much more flexible and um, what we'd like to sort of call organic scheme where it's really based on monthly meaningful conversations between people and their managers um, but it's also um, changed we've changed the way we can incrementally progress people so we are hoping to see better outcomes in terms of this year's ratings once they are taken through um, through the process we're working on those at the moment but and there will be a review of that carried out uh, in April this year to see how that's working um, there's reference in here 6.6 .6 apprenticeships. I know that's something that people are um, often keen to understand the picture on that. We currently have 123 uh, people taking apprenticeship qualification at the moment across a really broad range um, of um, roles and apprenticeship frameworks, which is really positive. And um, we've just had a um, first apprenticeships award ceremony. Some of you may have seen the publicity around that, which has been really, really positive. So that's, again, something that I think... Um, the Cambridge's L and D team have led on for the region, which has been fantastic. And the reward and recognition, um, Lindsay's already touched on the re uh, the real living wage. That was one of the things that I was going to highlight, and, and with the changes to our incremental progression. So those were the key things I wanted to draw out. There's a lot more information in here, obviously, but um, really this was to bring to your attention some of the key things that we've been doing and to show you the action plan we're working on, um, just for you to note. And obviously, if you've got any questions, we'd be very happy to pick them up. Thank you very much. Again, a very thorough um, report. So questions and comments. Councillor Shaler. Yeah, thanks so much for this. The, I'm interested in wearing my, my white ribbon and it's about these kind of behaviours and I, I very much like the skills development and behaviours because it's, this is about skills 
and this is about improving communication and ability to work across the um, the board so this you know we were talking previously about whistleblowing and you know bringing these but also about developing and skills and i see that there's a um an association between well-being also and this um my kind of question is with regards to working at home this brings in a domestic aspect to this as well and um what is our do we have a role um in terms of helping people um understand the nature of the difference between um aggressive behavior and and assertive behavior and all these sort of things you know do we have um a responsibility for care for people who are working at home for instance that sort of thing thank you yeah yes we we absolutely do have a responsibility for people who are working at home and um one of the things that we we picked up on quite early in the pandemic was the fact that we potentially had members of staff who were inherently more vulnerable by the fact that they suddenly found themselves working at home, whereas work may previously have provided something of an escape route for at least part of their time. Um, so we did uh, look at our policies and we took some advice and, and um, worked with our domestic uh, violence team to review our policy and um, provided some guidance for managers also around how to support people who might um, who might need that additional support. We, we were arranged for, in some cases, for people who um, disclosed that that was a particular situation for them to access a workplace, whereas the rest of us obviously were, were on a work from home arrangement. So we did have some people coming into work. Um, and uh, I think we also, in our policy, um, we created um, some additional time off for people. So we've put a policy in place for people to, um, take I think it's up to three days paid leave if they are trying to um, exit a difficult situation however we also recognize that not everybody chooses to do that and some people are living um, you know longer term um, with a with a difficult situation at home so the policy tries to create support for people who need it in the best way that we can recognizing that uh, also, we need to signpost specialist services because we don't have the, you know, the capability and the expertise always to provide the support people need. Thank you. Um, other comments or questions, suggestions, Lorna? Yeah, I, I was talking to an officer the other day, or they were talking to me, um, and their comment was about how much more hierarchical the organization felt since COVID. Um, I think part of that was around the, um, the, the, the meeting structures here. If you're an officer that might have expected previously to engage with members, whether that might have been through sort of corridor chat or coming along to meetings and so on, that now no longer happens. And it's only, and because of the restrictions on numbers in these rooms and so on, that you that their view was that it was only the most senior officers now that had a chance to have those conversations with members about their work and what they were doing. Um, and also, I think possibly it might be to do with the move to Walkenbury. I mean, there's nothing here. So you, you come here for a purpose and then you go. And you don't tend to hang around and maybe there's something there, even, you know, even when people are up to strength in numbers, maybe there's an issue there about people not hanging around in the way they might have previously. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm really not trying to say Cambridge is the centre of the world. I'm not from you know, I'm not from Cambridge and I don't subscribe to that mentality at all as someone who lives in one of the more rural districts. But nonetheless, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that where we are today is something of an outpost. Um, and I didn't know whether that was that particular officer's own individual view that wasn't shared more widely, or whether it was something that was shared more widely. And if so, whether that was on your radar and whether you knew 
that what you were doing about that, and we've heard about quite a lot of really good work that's been going on to try and engage differently with staff in the environment that we're in, with home working, with the vulnerabilities of COVID and, and all the rest of it. Um, whether that feeling that this was a now a more hierarchical organisation was something you'd come across, and if so, whether you have given any thought to how how we might deal with that, because I don't think that's the kind of organisation any of us would actually want to see this organisation becoming. Thank you. That's a, that's a, a, a really um, interesting question. I wonder if you had thoughts about it. Um, it's I, I haven't heard that before. Um, but listening to you saying that, I can understand why somebody might have might be feeling that, um, as you described, because of the way we've been working, that that organic sort of meeting of people around buildings and things hasn't happened. And it probably has been that only the most senior officers have been exposed to working with elected members so I can see why that would be an issue so it's something for us to go and reflect on and I'll talk I think I'll talk to Stephen about that because if one person's felt that then the chances are more have um, and I think we need to think about how we redress that yeah thank you thank you and before we come to Councillor Duke can I ask a related question which is um, that um, I think it's possibly the same sort of issue but when we talk about, um, I mean, the actions taken during the pandemic are very much the, the corporate nature of the organization exerting itself. There's so much onus put on managers to, to do things. Um, so one question is really a follow on from what Councillor Dupre has said that in a sense, this, this is expressed, the, 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 the policies and so on are sort of expressed through management exhortation and management um, instruction, direction, guidance and so on. But the flip side of that is um, managers are staff too. And in the pandemic, more has been asked of them. In fact, it's almost seems like a council of, of perfection and um, everyone has experienced difficulty I would say during the pandemic um, and and you know it, it is the support there for, for, for managers as well. Um, I think that's a that's a very good point um, and again we did um, in terms of providing support to managers we have tried to do that all the way through the all the way through the pandemic by making sure we're providing as much guidance as we can um, but specifically around supporting managers directly as individuals one of the things that we introduced um, was mental health awareness training for managers we've been rolling that out since pre-covid for all staff um, but what people were saying was it was it's obviously very difficult for managers and as individuals to support their teams and look after themselves so we've also had uh, sessions running all the way through and continue to do so to support managers with that yeah thank you councillor do thank you chair um yeah thank you for the report on this it actually helped me a lot on the previous item and there's various things you can see what's being done to actually uh, work things through the system so that, that that was really really useful um point that uh councillor dupre made is is a good one and i i think the crux of the matter was always going to be that once we left cambridge and no matter where we went and i, I agree there you know whether it's here or wherever that the, one of the things that was agreed on the council as a whole that we wouldn't have everyone in the building all the while so we've always had to accept that uh, we're going to have to deal with these issues. I think what COVID's done is accelerated it and expanded it. It was moved quicker and wider than it ever looked. But I still think we're going to have the same problem. And if it is a perceived problem that uh, people feel they're slightly outside the loop, we need to make sure even once things return to normal, if we can ever say they will, but uh, something that feels like normal, we're still going to have this very different working environment that not everyone is expected to be here or anywhere else 
every day. So how we build that into the structure, I presume you guys are well on the ball there anyway, and and, uh, and ahead of the loop on that. But I, but I think that's that's the, the, the long term problem we've got on it. But I think a lot of the other actions you're looking to take, you know, to to uh, you know recruit the right the right people and keep them. And around things like we were talking about assessments earlier. I mean, in the organisation I work in, you know, we, we've now differentiated and we differently split assessment from wages assessment is about how you perform your role and how, how i can help you as in one of my team do it better and vice versa how can you help me as a manager the, the wages come outside of that if there's still the perception that the two are linked we probably need to think about splitting that and i'll, I'll leave it there thank you thank you would you like to comment on that yeah if i can if i can pick up on the last point now that's an interesting point because Pre-COVID, it must have been um, towards the end of 2019, we had a lot of focus groups to look at our appraisal process. This is prior to the, the changes that have just been brought in. Um, and that was one of the biggest themes that came through from employees. Actually, they felt the appraisal process was a process to get a pay rise. We were missing out on all of that meaningful, you know, huge amounts of great information about what somebody done in the year, what are their successes, what are their achievements, what are their development, and what can we do to help them with that. Um, so we have tried in our in our new um, scheme that was brought in from April, we have tried to separate out those elements of pay from the appraisal side of things as much as possible. However, it's very difficult because we have a performance related pay framework. We don't have automatic increments and therefore there has to be some element of performance or differentiation to be able to give somebody that performance increase. But what we've done is, as I say, we've taken the appraisal side out to become a much more conversational based regular discussion rather than a yearly process with lots of paperwork. So it becomes more meaningful. We've encouraged managers to talk with their staff about their development not just in their current role but their longer term career development that will help with the aims of some of the, the pay gap reporting that we've talked about earlier um, and what we've then done is made that conversation about pay a separate annual pay conversation and we've named it you know a ratings conversation what it is quite simply that's the meeting at which you discuss whether or not your manager is going to be putting you forward for a pay increment so as much as it does consider some of that evidence from that conversational appraisal process it's as separate as we possibly can make it but i appreciate it's still not ideal thank you very much any other comments or points thank you that that was incredibly helpful um we're asked to note the information we it is duly noted. Um, next item is the cost of living increases. Janet. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, this is a much shorter paper. Um, just to set out the current position around the cost of living um, increases. Uh, so um, we have most the majority of our workforce up to, <clears throat> excuse me, up to um, what's senior officer two, which is about 32,000, Lindsay, 32,000 pounds are part of national pay bargaining um, and which set, um, negotiation, part of the national negotiations carried out by the NJC. Um, and those negotiations are at present still ongoing. <clears throat> so we don't have a, a we don't have a result uh, this year. Um, we know that the unions have balloted their members. Um, one has returned the result. That's Unison. Uh, GMB haven't yet shared the outcome. And Unite, I think the Unite ballot has only very recently closed. So we're waiting. Last week, yeah. So we're waiting for the result on that. So at the moment, this is the pay award that was due to be implemented from last April, um, and we still don't have the outcome on that. Um, <clears throat> so at Corp leadership team we had a conversation about this uh, fairly a few weeks ago um, because the pay for all those above that level uh, so all everyone on our professional and management scales as they're called um, is set locally not nationally negotiated um, within Cambridgeshire over the years we have tended to mirror the national pay award or not always set it at the same level some years it's been less it's never obviously been more um, but um, we've tended to mirror it for the most part um, and CLT uh, considered uh, what they wanted to do this year and took the view that um, we would 
implement the same level. So if it does get agreed at 1.75%, which we are anticipating that will is likely to happen at the moment, um, CLT wanted to implement the same 1.75 for professional management grades. Um, the decision around whether that should then also be applied to the corporate leadership team is a decision for this committee to make. So the decisions that we require is really we're asking committee to endorse the provisional 1.75% for the professional management grades to be implemented only if and when the JNC, the NJC pay um, deal is settled and then to invite you to consider what you wish to, would wish to do for um, the corporate leadership pay scales. Thank you. Great. Uh, comments, questions, Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Questions from me on this one. I, I found myself rather confused by this one. Um, and um, I'm, I've got, my understanding from this paper is that there are three different categories of staff that the lower paid staff, uh, uh, their pay rise is settled nationally and that we follow that procedure that there is there are the PM scales professional management yeah um, where the pay is set by the chief executive according to 2.2 uh, and we're asked to endorse that and then there's the sorry um, and then there's the CLT pay grade which is up to us to determine so that first tier is straightforward the second tier we're asked to endorse something that the chief executive has the power to set. And I just wondered what, what would happen if we didn't? Because if we're asked to endorse something, there is, there is that question, what happens if we say no? And, and you can't really ask us to endorse, us, <laughs> endorse something without explaining what happens if we, it, it, you know, if we decide that there's a better course of action. And I'm not saying I would not want to endorse it. I'm just not clear what our remit is on that middle grade. The top grade, I am clearer about our remit. We're being asked to make a decision. And there are three options there for us. And I'm going back to the discussion that we had earlier about the pay ratio. What do we want to achieve here? Um, we were very clear as an administration that we wanted to implement the real living wage to raise the wages of the lowest paid staff. Do we want to address the pay ratio in some way by going for the lowest increase for the, the top grade to address in some way that ratio. And we, we had that discussion about whether we are monitoring or just reporting. You know, if, 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 there is an, if there is an outcome that we think is more desirable than another, should we be choosing the, the option one in order to do something about that towards a goal, which I don't think we're really quite clear that we've got, we haven't got a target. Should, you know, and, but, and is that, what should be the criterion at the front of our minds when we make this decision between options one, two, and three? Or is it about um, equi you know, equity in, in the sense of you treat every grade equally? Or, you know, what is, what is equitable? And I come back to the question I asked earlier about the definitions. So it's raising all sorts of questions and I'm not clear which criteria I'm being asked to consider here. And whether I'm being asked about criteria that relate to individual members of staff on those senior grades and, you know, reward and well-being and all of that, or whether I'm being asked in a kind of frame of reference that is about the, the ratios in the organisation as a whole and creating a, a, a more, you know, squashed, if you like, pay structure and one that where you know, we, we've, we've lifted the bottom rates of pay. Do we want to lower the top ones correspondingly? And is this the right mechanism to do that? So what should I be thinking about? And I wasn't sure that the report actually guided me very much in that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, I mean, there's two questions there. In terms of the remit, um, endorse, um, can I just get some clarification, please, on what that is? Is it a, a right of veto, as it were? So, so um, the 
constitution, I'm looking at Michelle, <laughs> um, the constitution does set out that it, it's the chief executive who sets the pay, but historically, uh, and we probably ought to have made this clearer, and I, I can only apologise for that, historically it has been brought to Staffing and Appeals Committee for to be, en to be endorsed. Uh, I realise that's hearing the way you've described it, it's quite woolly. Um, and by virtue of that, I would say that if you are unhappy with that, then I would take that back from this committee. If you say that you were uncomfortable with supporting or endorsing it, uh, then I would take that back for a discussion with CLT, with, with Stephen. Perhaps uh, it's more accurate to say to note, um, because we note other things that uh, decisions elsewhere, we might have uh, observations about it, but endorse does sound like we are giving our approval as well. Um, so if it is to note, um, is that acceptable to everyone? Is that, that seems to be literally what the constitutional position is. I think it depends what the constitutional position is. And I'd like, a, I'd like a ruling. I don't want to cause trouble and I don't particularly want to oppose what's being, uh, what, what the chief executive has, uh, you know, has decided if indeed the chief executive has decided. Um, but uh, so there's a wording endorse versus note, but there's also a constitutional position of what are we entitled to do? Is it possible to get an answer now, or is that something that we need to reserve and come back on? I'm just looking at your terms of reference um, regarding that. And um, you have got um, authority to determine the policy regarding the remuneration of statutory and non-statutory chief officers. So that's what Janet's brought to you. Um, and you've got um, authority for the approval of pay terms and conditions and service of training of employees, except for the annual um, senior officer pay policy, policy statement. So, uh, so I think I think the point that whilst you may not have specific terms of reference relating to that band of employee, um, I think what Janet is saying that if you disagreed with what's being proposed then I think you have the right to challenge it. And obviously then it's for the chief executive to review whether the decision they're opting for is the correct decision. And so I think the whole process is the chief executive may have the power or the delegation. That doesn't mean necessarily mean they have to exercise it. Um, and you do have the right to challenge that decision. Um, we could theoretically under the constitution not bring it to you, but I'm not sure whether that would be the right, right thing, bearing in mind the impact on all the other um, bands of, of officers. Thank you, does that help? Um, it sort of helps, but that then makes my second question all the more meaningful. What are we trying to achieve here? Because I don't know what we're trying to achieve here and therefore I don't really know what I feel about the decision that the chief executive has made, let alone the decision that we're being asked to make about that, that CLT tier. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Shaler and Councillor Netzinger. Yes, so there seems to be a difference between noting and having the option to not approve. Approve, not approve. I, I, don't know. Um, I was a bit confused about it as well, I have to say. The, um, the idea, you know, in, in recent years, we've seen a, a burgeoning difference between upper management and those at the coalface, as it were. And, you know, there are a lot of people who want to kind of rein that in. And I understand that we have recruitment problems. And this is in high ways, it's across the industry, milestone of about 25%, they can't recruit and that sort of thing. So, so you know, I understand those, those kind of things as well. Um, but it does come down to what's fair. Do we know nationally what the uplift is going to be for the, the lowest paid group? It's, I, I would hate to, to give the, the upper um, ones a pay rise and then find that the, the lowest paid in, in the organisation get nothing. You know? so, so do we know about that? Should we go to Councillor Netzinger before? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So my understanding and my reading of this was that the assumption is that it will be 1.75 and that the assumption is therefore that we will um, have the same pay increase across the whole organisation. Um, and I have to say that under the current circumstances, that seems like um, a reasonable and fair thing to do. Um, I absolutely take Lorna's point, and I think that um, it, there, there are a few things that we've discussed today that it would be quite interesting to spend a bit longer and, and look at in a bit more depth. And I think some of the discussion we had earlier about gender pay gap and what the appropriate ways to try and tackle that might be, um, I would really welcome an, an opportunity to spend a bit more time looking at that. And it might be interesting to spend a bit more time looking at this as well. Um, but I am painfully aware reading these documents that actually the cost of living um, is going to go up by very significantly more than 1.75% this year. Um, and that um, and, and that re recruiting and retaining staff is not easy across the whole organisation. Um, and therefore, I would be happy to endorse the um, proposals from the chief executive and for our senior staff for today. Um, but I do think that that actually going away and having a look at what our goals are um, and, and what we can do across the organisation to try and make sure that we're meeting those goals, um, perhaps um, having a workshop on that or something a bit later, um, would, would definitely be an appropriate thing to do so that when this comes around again next year, we have um, a, a kind of real confidence in, in what we're um, looking at. Not that we haven't this time, I have to say, I think the papers have been very good, but I do also think that there is time, it's an appropriate moment to, to review our people strategy and a number of other things. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Councillor Dew. I echo a lot of what Councillor Netzing has just said. I think this is the cost of living review. Um, it's not necessarily to be used to, uh, you know, uh, and deal with all our uh, issues that we've discussed earlier at once. And it's, as, as has quite rightly been said, about the additional information, we're not even in a position to accurately do that. I'd hate to do something off the hoof and actually make a problem worse where, you know, it may be that um, there is a fairer system where the three levels get looked at differently. But the one we've got at the moment is, um, you know, very much falling from one to the other. And I, I would endorse the fact that, you know, as I say, the uh, increase this year needs to probably be within the remit set there. I'm, I, I am quite happy with the, with the three areas. I mean, one's outside our control end of story, so that's easy for me. Um, the one in the middle, it strikes me that, um, you know, the, the chief executive makes, the, makes his recommendation to us, but it's uh, a bit of a rhetorical recommendation. So therefore, I think we'd be unwise to appoint the new chief executive and almost instantly disagree with him over something like this. <laughs> and, I mean, it can be. I know I, I'm playing with the words there, Councillor, but it is, you know, because at the end of the day, I, you know, the, the, we've been told that the chief executive sets it, he passes it to us, but he doesn't need to. So to a degree, you know, I think we, we should support him on that. And lastly, a lot of our senior officers have only just arrived. So uh, whether or not we're doing cost of living increases is a mute point, but it might be if we set the right rate for them, we need to make sure we're not recruiting new chief officers next year because other people have done otherwise in a competitive market. So I think it needs looking at, I think that the middle band, I can understand the reticence on that needs to be, you know, how much control, you know, and support can we give on that? But I, I think at the minute it, it, it is as it is, and I'm, I'm quite happy to support thank you would you like to come back thank you just um, on a few points that have been raised um it, i think it it's a it's been a really interesting and useful discussion and um, thing gives us food for thought about how we might approach this going forward and i think a lot of this um hinges on um councillor nestinger's um rec reference to you know what is um, and the dear councillor Dupre, what is our pay strategy and that's something that we've been talking about um that we need a, a very clear pay and reward strategy that sits as part of our people strategy and that will focus on some of these things that you've challenged around are we trying to reduce some of the differentials and if so how are we going to do that um so i think we will it would be useful to have some more meaningful debate around that once we've had an opportunity to flesh, to flesh something out that we think might work um, to bring to you as a starting point um just to answer a couple of the other points uh, in terms of this is very much it is a cost of living award um not performance related in any way that um, all of the corporate leadership team their performance is rated 
as um, Lindsay described previously in the report, the same way as every other member of staff across the organisation, so that will have taken place. Um, and I, I think I ought to just point out it was um, it was the decision that um, that was made by CLT was before Stephen joined us. We had this a couple of weeks ago, so um, yeah. <laughs> so he um, he will be aware of it. Obviously, he is aware of the, of the decision that was taken and the recommendation, but it wasn't actually. It wasn't actually him involved in that, but I'm sure he'd be very much involved about looking at this, um, our future pay and reward strategy. Thanks. Thank you. So we, we have um, done a lot of clarifying uh, of our remit, our role, uh, the decision-making process, um, and indeed um, had a proposal to uh, have a 1.75 cost of living increase for the whole organization as something which is separate from performance plus uh, a, uh, a a bit of a push on making a step change in our pay gap uh, what would that involve and there's been a suggestion of a workshop to really put our foot on the accelerator um, on that to see what's possible, what is possible. So um, is everyone supportive of all those things that I've said? Are there any disagreements or you know, nuances that uh, people would like to explore? No. Um, Councillor Shaler. Can I just make the point that this is not going to be a cost of living. Obviously, the cost of living is likely to, to go, I don't know, above 5% anyway. So it's going to be, a, in effect, a pay cut. Just well, it, yes, up. thank you. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's a contribution to a cost of living increase, whereas um, it's already well north of 5% and it's likely to sort of get worse. So uh, it is just a contribution towards that. So if, if everyone is happy, then I think that we will... Yes. May I just, just point out that um, there is the possibility that um, the outcome of the national negotiations may differ. It's not looking particularly likely, but there is a possibility. So I think what we're asking for today is an agreement in principle. And should that suddenly differ, so should it suddenly increase, we would come back to you to, to ask you whether you wanted to um, reflect that anywhere else in the organisation. But if it stays at 1.75, that's then we would implement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if it's lower? I can't imagine it would go lower because the unions have just balloted on 1.75, so I can't imagine. Thank there you. Um, think. In, in that case, we, and I choose my words carefully, we endorse and do not challenge the uh, one, provisional 1.75% 1 increase for PNM uh, roles and uh, introduce a 1.75 contribution to cost of living increase for the corporate leadership pay scale. Thank you. Um, unless there's anything further, that is the end of business today. Thank you very much indeed.